just want to thank you and, and Sierra uh, Circuits for uh, hosting this seminar. And this is a brand new topic for me where I've uh, really consolidated uh, a lot of um, important topics into one seminar. Uh, for those who I haven't met yet, uh, I am um, EMC consultant based here in Colorado. And uh, today it is snowing. So I'm glad to be inside, uh, able to uh, speak to so many of you. So uh, today I'm going to cover uh, with, with apologies to Dr. Uh, Stephen Covey, who wrote the book, uh, The Seven Habits of Highly Successful People. Um, I thought I'd uh, do something similar uh, for EMC designs. And uh, so we're going to talk about, um, I think, the uh, what I believe are the seven most important designs, uh, design concepts that you can uh, add to your um, or incorporate into your product designs. We're going to uh, first talk about PC boards because that really turns out to be the key factor in whether you're going to meet EMC, uh, either emissions or immunity standards. Uh, we'll talk about uh, how to identify uh, noisy ener energy sources and how to partition um, the circuit sections on your circuit board to avoid cross-coupling uh, noisy to um, quiet circuits. We'll talk um, about filtering and where to locate your I.O. and power ports for lowest EMI. Talk about cable termination and pigtails, um, traces co crossing gaps, um, grounding and signal returns, and finally, uh, local shielding and uh, something new that you may not um, have considered, but that I'm starting to incorporate in uh, many of the RF or the Wi-Fi or uh, wireless designs is uh, the use of RF absorber. So we're going to be um, plugging right along here quickly. Uh, many of these topics have been covered in much more detail in other webinars or articles that I've written. And if you um, if you uh, simply do a search on um, uh, for, for my name and then EMC, you'll you'll see a lot of references. Um, and as far as circuit board design and stack up, there's a couple other, there's a couple other uh, people I'd recommend, um, Rick Hartley and Dan Beaker. And um, so doing a search on those two uh, of my colleagues uh, should yield um, quite a lot more information on circuit boards. So let's dive in. Um, understanding how circuits, uh, or how signals propagate, uh, will will give you a real competitive advantage over your your competitors and so we want to cover this first um so one thing to understand is that um emc designers is all about um currents and where currents are flowing uh, as as a digital designer, you're more uh, interested in voltage levels, uh, highs and lows. And um, so uh, for, for a good EMC design, you really want to consider currents and how currents flow. Because if we interrupt that flow of current, uh, you're going to end up with uh, EMC issues. So here's here's the first thing to understand. And that is uh, when you have a source here uh, and a load, um, you've got um, currents traveling on the uh, on the trace here, but the return currents at low frequency tend to 
spread out quite a lot. And uh, that's where we can get into trouble uh, at low frequencies is if you have uh, a very close high speed trace sharing that same return path, uh, you, then you're gonna get cross coupling between noisy and quiet circuits. Um, fortunately, at, at, at frequencies greater than, um, than 100 kilohertz, Um, the return currents travel um, essentially underneath the circuit trace. Now, the other, the other thing to consider is that uh, circuit board traces are actually transmission lines, uh, especially if you're dealing with uh, frequencies of 100 kilohertz or higher, and most of us are in that realm. Um, so we have a circuit's point of view where Signals and power require a return path back to the source, and this return path needs to be uninterrupted. And uh, so we'll talk about that coming up. Uh, there's also the field's point of view, and, and this is the important concept to understand. And that is that uh, signal and power transient fields travel, or are electro, uh, actually electromagnetic waves that travel in the dielectric space at near light speed, while the conduction and displacement currents simultaneously flow back to the source at a uh, very, very slow uh, velocity called the drift velocity. It's much less than uh, one millimeter per second. So it's not the um, electrons in copper that's, that's your signal. The signal is actually the electromagnetic wave that's trapped between the circuit trace and the return plane. And that is a really key concept to understand. Um, we'll start out with the concept of displacement current. Um, capacitors are really energy storage devices, and uh, that energy is stored as a voltage across the plates. If we close the switch here, uh, we're going to get um, for example, plus ch charges on one side, which are going to re repel any plus charges on the other, uh, giving us with minus charges, le leaving us with minus charges. And if this um, uh, goes to an AC source or a high frequency source, now it's going to look like uh, we get current flow through that dielectric. And it it's really the uh, transfer of energy from one side to the other. Uh, where this comes into play is uh, when we consider how a signal propagates on a microstrip. So, for example, we have, um, let's say we have a, a digital circuit going from high to a low uh, state. Um, and there's a, there's a transition region here where all the, uh, the magic um, uh, harmonic uh, harmonic uh, energy is generated, and this this is what um, what we EMC engineers deal with typically. So at this transition point, the the rise or fall time of the, of the digital signal, uh, that's where all the harmonic energy is is um, is, and um, this this edge is. Um, represented by the, the uh, red and blue arrows. This is the current flow from the source back to um, where it started. So that's the, conduct the conducted and displacement currents, and those are flowing very slowly. However, when this wave front is rapidly um, uh, transitioning along the transmission line from, uh, say, point A to point B, um, that that represents this this leading edge here moving over to this point. Um, so this this is actually uh, an electromagnetic 
uh, field in, in the dielectric space here. And uh, in FR4, it is uh, moving at roughly six inches per nanosecond. The important point is that we need to keep this electromagnetic wave captured uh, between the copper trace and the, um, the nearest metal, which um, usually is a plane or a return plane. And we want those to be adjacent. So um, the digital signal propagates via kinks in the E-field, and I'm not prepared to go much deeper in the physics of this, but uh, there's a couple good examples that uh, um, show you how energy flows. Uh, one is the Newton's cradle here, and we're all probably familiar with, with that when we raise one of the balls it knocks off a ball on the other side. Um, so the balls in the middle are actually not moving, but they are transferring energy, and that's what is happening in the um, electromagnetic wave and the, and the, um, the electrons in the copper. For a radiating field, um, this represents is represented by kinks in the E field. And um, so we have a point source here and it's radiating out this uh, in all directions here, assuming it's a point source. And this kink is the electromagnetic wave. Um, another good uh, analogy is to uh, when you throw a rock in the in a pond, uh, the ripples um, travel outward, but the actual water molecules are are uh, stay the same. They, they they go up and down, but they don't travel. So it's really the energy that's traveling. So um, what does this all mean? Uh, there's there's some design guidelines for uh, designing your PC boards for low EMI, and these are, uh, every signal trace needs an adjacent solid return plane. Every power plane or trace needs an adjacent um, solid return plane as well. And this dictates your stack up. And th this also includes the return paths up and down through layers. So um, I'll, I'll show you on the next slide uh, an example of, of why that is, um, is uh, important. So um, th this is a, a typical but poor uh, four-layer design that I deal with um, my clients uh, frequently. Um, they'll have uh, signal signals on uh, the outside layers, the top and bottom layers. They'll have a, a re ground return plane um, and a power plane. Um, but it's often separated, these planes are often separated by uh, 30 to 40 mils. And that's, um, that's really too far apart for good high frequency decoupling between those two planes. Um, the, also, the other uh, issue is that uh, the signal traces on the bottom layer are referenced to the power plane, uh, not the, the ground return. And so, um, sources are usually a reference to the, the ground return plane, not the power plane. And that's where the return currents want to travel. And so uh, we're, we're just making it harder for them to get back to the source. So um, there's some alternatives to the four layer stack up. Um, if we use um, signals uh, on the top and bottom layer, signals and routed power, 
in reference to two ground reference planes, uh, that um, that follows the the two important rules for PC board design. Uh, in some cases, um, it affords a little more shielding if the ground return planes are on the outside layers. <clears throat> And there's there's other ways of uh, configuring four layer board designs, but the important point is uh, we want all signals and power to be referenced to a, a solid return plane. Uh, six layer board stack ups. Uh, this one on the on the left is a, a very common design that I run into frequently as well. And it has a there's one additional one. So uh, I have no complaint about this stack up here. Uh, this stack up uh, has the same issues as a four layer board where signals are referenced to power plane. Now for you know some some people say I'm kind of a stickler for that. and um, th there's certain cases where, uh, low risk traces can be referenced to, and uh, just as long as you have a good decoupling between the power plane and return plane, uh, that that works okay. Um, but in the case of a sixty-two mil board, you know the spacing here between the power plane and return return and power uh, is still way too far apart for good decoupling, uh, high frequency decoupling. So um, we have that plus uh, any transients on the on the power rail are going to reference back to the return plane and you're going to get uh, power transient couples uh, coupling to the two inner signal la layers. So, um, you know, the, this pretty standardized stack up that I, I see all the time is um, has got some problems uh, EMC wise. Um, there are, uh, again, several different ways of um, configuring a six layer stack up that follows those rules. Here's one of them where we have um, signals and, and routed power reference to return plane on the top two and bottom two layers, and then power and ground return in the center. So that's that's one way you, you do lose some signal layers that way. But uh, again, there's there's other good answers. To this. Okay, let's let's move on to habit two: uh, traces crossing gaps. Uh, this happens more frequently than I like to see, and it it um, uh, frankly keeps food on the table for EMC consultants. So, um, so a lot of a lot of problems on the PC board can be traced to what we call discontinuous signal return paths. And um, so one of the one of the things I look at first when I'm looking at a board design is uh, I'll, I'll take a look at the, um, so the signal return layers or ground return layers and see how solid they are. I'll see if there's any gaps in them. And uh, frequently there I, I do see gaps. So um, um, this can. Um, when the when the return path is broken like that, uh, it can cause a number of issues, and I'll, I'll show you some of them. So if we have a a source and a load, <clears throat> I've tried to represent the dielectric space as uh, and the and the uh, electromagnetic wave uh, as little red lines here. Uh, so the the uh, circuit trace is acting as a waveguide and in reference to the uh, to plane number one here. So um, the signal is transitioning through here 
where we get into a problem is um, uh, where is the return path um, to, to get back to the source? And uh, we, we don't have a defined return path. If, um, if both these layers are ground, or ground return, I should say, uh, then simply um, using a stitching via between the two layers will give you a return path back to the source. Um, if where, where it gets a little tricky is if you have a ground return and a voltage plane, you can't be shorting them together. So um, what we do then is um, we mount a, a decoupling capacitor Uh, right, right where the uh, signal say this is a high frequency signal. Now, now we have a, a high frequency return path uh, back through that decoupling capacitor. Uh, here's another example where we're crossing gaps here. Uh, we're also crossing an analog return plane with a high frequency. Uh, the, the return current is going to want to go. It's going to be forced out around this gap back to the back to the source, and so we have this uh, loop, a large loop area which we don't want. Plus, we have gaps, so uh, this 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 can lead to um, cross coupling between noisy and quiet circuits, uh, as well as edge radiation uh, coming out the the board edges. I uh, I have a, a good demonstration during my live seminars where where I actually show you the difference between uh, running a trace over a gap here and um, no gap on the bottom, and uh, so I um, <clears throat> I simulate a high speed digital signal by injecting a um, two nanosecond pulse into the BNC connectors and, and then measuring um, the difference between when I connect that pulse source between the um, ungapped versus gapped traces. And uh, you can also attach, uh, my, my video is over the top of this, let me move it over. You can also attach a cable to the ground, uh, the, the ground return Lane and measure the the um, coupled currents coming out this this wire using a current probe, and um, so this next slide shows the difference between gapped and ungapped. The um, aqua is ungapped, so its levels are about here and here and here and here. You can see the gapped trace. Um, there's there's about a 10 to 15 dB higher EMI uh, coupled to that that um, wire as measured with a current probe. So uh, just shows you um, that uh, it's not a good idea to run a trace, uh, a high speed trace over a gap. Uh, habit three, um, how to identify noisy circuits on your circuit board. And, and we use uh, near field probes for that. Um, and here I'm measuring uh, a DC to DC converter and um, you'll, you'll see other, other high uh, energy, high harmonic circuits throughout your circuit board. And uh, the idea is you want to uh, identify uh, those noise sources because uh, once you identify the, the noise sources on your circuit board, then you can correlate the, the noise profile uh, that get, gets coupled out to cables, for example. So here on the, on the upper left is a 48 megahertz clock uh, with its, all its harmonics. 
Uh, here on the lower left is a typical DC to DC converter, which is, you can see it's a looks like broad, uh, broad spectrum of, of EMI. And very often you'll see uh, a combination of narrow band and broadband. And so, um, and then of course, a spread spectrum where you have uh, a little wider looking um, narrow band pulse basically, or narrow band harmonic. So um, once you identify these type of noise sources, then you can correlate to see what noise source might be coupling out on on um, a, a cable. Um, the concept of partitioning is important because uh, as you recall from the very first slide where we were looking at return, the simulation of return currents, where low frequency currents were kind of spread out on the return plane and high frequency currents were captured nicely under the, the circuit trace. Uh, we can use that to our advantage um, in, in um, uh, avoiding um, noisy circuits coupling to, to, to quiet circuits. And very often that occurs on the return plane where uh, high frequency re currents return in the same area as, as uh, um, um, low frequency currents like audio circuits, for example, or low speed uh, sensor circuits. Um, and, and the whole concept is, uh, you know, this example is for, for uh, a typical wi uh, wireless board. We certainly want to keep the wireless uh, circuitry away from digital and motor control and DC to DC converters, if, if possible. And um, analog circuitry should be, you know, apart from digital from the same. Um, and then uh, one thing we'll talk about later is uh, grouping all your um, connectors together on one edge of the board. And I'll explain why that is important uh, later. But uh, the concept is is uh, separating out circuit functions uh, so, that, so that we don't cross couple noisy things with quiet things. And it's not often... Um, uh, realistic to do that, uh, but but this shows you the concept. So habit four, uh, filtering and locating I.O. and port, power ports. I kind of just led up to that, that uh, concept. <laughs> so uh, th th this is a slide I'm borrowing from Dr. Todd Hubing, which uh, uh, he goes into this a lot more detail uh, than I do, and I, 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 um, I would recommend um, going to his website, uh, learn, and this will be in the reference. LearnEMC.com, if I can write. <clears throat> That's his website. Uh, he's got some excellent training courses. But what I wanted to discuss was um, this upper example. When we put a, a a cable out on these connectors, the connectors are are opposite each other on the circuit board. Well, the circuit board has uh, some noisy uh, voltage sources. Um, often we call these uh, noise currents. Uh, or noise voltages, which drive these noise currents, um, common currents or common mode currents. Uh, these are currents we don't really want to generate on the board. Um, and when you cross a trace with a gap, that's one very common way of creating these common mode currents. So let's say we have this, this noisy board and we put cables on each side of it. Well, that's that's looking an awful lot like a, a dipole antenna, um, which will I'll, I'll show you a, a, a picture of that in a moment. By, by grouping your connectors, the I.O. and power connectors together, 
um, we have less chance of there being this voltage source between the two. Um, and so that that's really the the whole the important concept here. Because uh, now now when we connect cables, let's do a little erasing here. Now when we connect cables to these connectors, the voltage uh, theoretically would be a lot less than than the voltage here uh, in the middle of the board. Uh, then we get less radiation from these cables. So here's here's the concept. If we have a port here and a port here, um, and oh, let's see, let's let's do it this way. If this is our board um, with a voltage, uh, noise noise voltage or currents, noise currents. Um, if if we um, if we have a half wavelength um, worth of cables, and most I/O cables are going to be about a meter long, so uh, that's going to resonate around um, 90, 90 megahertz or so, and um, so that's that's. <laughs> why we have um, uh, commonly uh, harmonics in the 100 to 200 megahertz range, okay? So um, because it's these cables, um, the cables that we attach are resonant in, in those frequency ranges. But um, so, so the currents, if it's a resonant dipole, the currents are going one way and then the other way at whatever fre resonant frequency and um, if you lower the voltage that's driving uh, you'll get less emissions that's that's the important point um going back to uh, to uh, filtering now um uh, you're um mainly concerned with um you know, not only emissions, but emissions gets helped mostly by proper EMC or pr proper PC board design and, uh, you know, avoiding crossing gaps and so forth. So that, that, that helps the emissions part. But the immunity part, um, I'm finding uh, more issues with uh, radiated immunity and ESD. Um, raising up as, as issues uh, lately. And uh, so you want to uh, add some kind of um, ESD transient protection. And this is um, explained in pretty good detail in the Magnetics uh, Trilogy of Magnetics, um, where I pull these figures. But the, um, you know, this this initial ESD pulse right here is a is a high frequency low energy part of the waveform. There's very little energy there, but it it produces a very high uh, E field, which bathes the entire circuit board and causes um, things like CPU resets. It's this low frequency. Um, high energy part of the curve of the ESD pulse that can destroy components or uh, you know cause uh, and that's that's why we want to clamp this part of the wave with transient protectors and uh, here's here's a couple other slides that I'm borrowing from uh, from uh, Todd um, so th so this is some some techniques that you can use for um, protecting against these high frequency transients that that initial uh, this part of the wave of the ESD pulse and that would be uh, including uh, capacitors across each signal pin very commonly done for automotive 
and um, other signaling purposes and uh, transient protector. So, so those um, and and that and, and we're going right to the digital return plane. And if you have a chassis, uh, we want to uh, connect the return plane to chassis somehow. Um, but so many products anymore don't have a chassis. And so the best we can do is go to the, the digital return plane. Uh, for this um, low frequency, high energy transients, uh, that, that's where we need to put uh, various transient protectors in, uh, as well as uh, common mode chokes for uh, things like USB um, filters in your DC uh, rails. And that, that all helps the low frequency part of that ESD. Okay, habit five, uh, we're going to talk about cable termination and pigtails. Um, so we never want to penetrate a shield with a wire cable. And this is um, an example from Henry Ott. Um, when we do that, um, we're allowing noise currents to get out that cable as well as um, radiated or, or um, a transmitter or um, external environmental factors to like ESD and um, various, uh, say, walkie-talkies or cell phone energy to get back in to our circuit and cause disruption. So um, there's, you, you wouldn't think that this would be a problem, but it's actually pretty common. And here's, here's some examples. Um, so uh, this is what I find all the time. We, we uh, attach our IO connectors to the circuit board and then we mount the circuit board in the chassis, um, just allowing the connectors to poke through holes. So as soon as you connect a, a cable up, you've now penetrated your chassis or your enclosure. And um, the result is um, poor or failing margins, as you can see in the picture there. Um, as, an, as an experiment, I jammed my uh, screwdriver blade in between the connector and the metal chassis. And we went from, from uh, a lot of emissions to very little. It, it reduced things, the emissions by 10 to 15 dB as measured by a current probe here on the cable. I don't know how many of you have uh, dealt with HDMI cables. Um, the, some of these cables are um, poorly constructed and include pigtails. Here's a pigtail right here. That's uh, about an inch and a half or th about three centimeters long. Here's another pigtail. And uh, the problem is the uh, working group that defined the HDMI um, cable uh, did not include uh, directions for how to terminate the, the cable shield. And there's a really good paper here um, at uh, DesignCon a few years ago. Um, I've got it linked uh, if you'd like to learn more. But they um, they tested. There were four cables here and two cables here. What they did was um, they they drove each cable uh, from thirty to a thousand megahertz and measured the emissions. And four of the cables were pretty close, but two of them were 20 dB higher emissions. And those are the two depicted in the previous slide that had the, the long pigtails. Now pigtails, um, you know, if you have a, a shielded product, it's, it's easier to use a, um, a, a nice metal connector with a metal back shell and terminate that shield right to the back shell. Um, but so many of our products anymore uh, do not 
have a shielded enclosure. And so uh, where, do you, where do you terminate the pigtails? And the answer, the, the only, the only um, answer really is to terminate it to the digital return plane. Uh, but there's some tricks you can use rather than using a single pigtail uh, as depicted in the upper ones here, you, you want to make it as short as possible. Um, that's one thing you can do. Uh, the other thing you can do is um, use two pigtails uh, because what happens is the magnetic flux lines around those fields tend to, uh, those pigtails tend to cancel. And so the more pigtails you use, the better. Um, our, our military and aerospace friends, of course, have it a lot easier because those mill connectors uh, uh, allow you to, to use a, what we call a 360 degree shield termination. Um, okay, habit six. Uh, grounding and signal returns. Uh, so here's another borrowed slide from Todd uh, Hubing. Uh, ground, uh, we, we need to be careful what ground means. Um, in product design, a ground is really referred to as a, as a safety ground, <clears throat> uh, which is uh, the whole purpose is to return fault currents uh, back back to earth basically uh, to protect the the user or operator of the equipment uh, when we're talking about signals and power we're really talking about signal return and power return uh, we should not be using the term ground for that um, and then of course, you know, some some people think, or some designers uh, believe that uh, products should be uh, safety grounded back to earth. Well, in actuality, we we have a lot of systems that cannot do that. Satellites, for example, aircraft, vehicles. Uh, none of these are connected to earth, but they do have ground structures that we can use for a uh, reference point, really. So definition of a ground loop, uh, you've probably heard of that. Uh, a ground loop is simply um, two different sources sharing the same return path. That's, that's all it is. And we wanna avoid that. We can avoid it through partitioning uh, of noisy versus quiet circuits. But that's that's what a ground loop is. It's usually a lower frequency phenomena, uh, but not always. And again, um, uh, Dr. Hubing uh, in his uh, Learn EMC uh, website uh, goes into much more detail. Um, here's, um, I'm gonna put this back in this corner. Sorry about that. Um, so here's a here's a case uh, for frequencies lower than 100 kilohertz. Um, it, it is possible for one subsystem to share the return path of of a different subsystem. And if, if this is, um, say, a quiet system, and this is a noisy system then you're going to get uh, noise on uh, coupled to that quiet circuit. At higher frequencies, it's a little easier because now we, we understand that um, the return currents are going to return um, adjacent to the signal path. And in the case of a circuit trace, uh, that return current will be uh, directly under that trace predominantly. Uh, so here's where uh, where we get into some realities. Um, here are some things you can do as a designer 
to um, reduce the loop areas. For example, we have a clock circuit here and the nearest return wire is here. So, so we've got this whole return loop that um, that that's that's a bad thing. That's a bad design. Uh, we want the clock and the return path for that clock to be adjacent when we're defining the flex cables or ribbon cables. Um, where I find issues, and I know this is a little hard to read, but here's uh, VCC uh, plus voltage. And uh, the ground return, uh, the return path is close there, but here's all the video, which um, is, is all single-ended video in this case. And the nearest return path is, is here. So, so we have a whole bunch of uh, loops for the current return that is bad. And um, that's why you'll find that LCD displays are particularly noisy. Uh, that's one reason. And um, so um, I don't know the answer to this because uh, the designers of these LCD displays define the pinout. And I, I don't think there's much that you as designers can do about that. So um, I, I find that um, bonding LCD, uh, the, the metal holders for the display, bonding it to chassis uh, or resorting to uh, ferrite chokes around the, the LCD cable are uh, solutions. Uh, the last habit is um, local shielding and use of RF absorber. And um, the RF absorber I, I mentioned earlier, uh, that's, that's a kind of a newer technique that I'm starting to use, uh, especially for wireless designs. Uh, but local shielding, it, it's all about um, shielding the noisy parts of your circuit. And a lot of these can be um, identified uh, readily. Uh, it'll be, it'll include uh, DC to DC converters, um, uh, CP, uh, digital uh, processors and memory, uh, clock circuits, and things like that, that are obvious high energy, high harmonic sources. And this becomes especially important uh, for wireless designs, um, as well as products that uh, do not have um, a metallic enclosure. And more and more consumer and industrial and medical products um, do not use metal enclosures anymore. And so it's, it gives us designers more of a challenge to uh, be able to meet EMC issues. EMC standards. And so uh, when you're designing your circuit board layout, you you want to, I, I always encourage uh, adding uh, these, these um, grounding um, features here where you can um, easily attach a local shield should you need it, okay? You, you may not need it, but if you do need it, um, it's it's better to have a place to attach it easily, because uh, adding a, a local shield to a circuit board that doesn't have these features is really tough to uh, to implement. So I I call this fencing uh, uh, ground fencing uh, connected to the digital return plane. So here's um, some data uh, by um, one of my colleagues, Patrick DeRoy, where he's showing um, the reduction in E field uh, versus H field. And um, these, these local shields are much better at reducing the E field, which uh, is generated um, mostly 
by uh, high switched voltages like you would find on DC to DC converters. Um, it's also effective for H fields, but not, not as much. So here, this is just some data and, and the shield is about a centimeter above the circuit board. Um, here's um, another paper at DesignCon uh, where uh, engineers at Samsung uh, compared local shielding to no local shielding on one of their smartphones. And you can see the difference in um, in the um, um, electromagnetic field. And um, pretty much uh, all our, our uh, smartphones now are, uh, almost every electronic circuit in there has got uh, local shields. Now, I, I do wanna talk about RF absorber and um, just, just quickly because um, this is um, a technique that that I um, found very useful for uh, for uh, wireless products. Um, so I, I did a study on a number of uh, these flexible ferrite absorber materials and found a couple that that worked really well. Um, I, I turned out it turned out I was using this for this particular example. I was working on a, um, a body-worn uh, device that uh, had some some defined uh, high harmonic noise sources. Uh, one of them was a video camera and its flex cable here. Uh, another was uh, some RAM and another was um, some DC to DC converter uh, ICs. And you can see where I have stuck the um, flexible absorber right down onto the circuits. Um, here's the before and after. Uh, here I am measuring the um, emissions out the side of this device. And um, I'm getting a, a high video signal here plus uh, three narrowband harmonics uh, well actually there's a whole bunch of them right here um, so these these narrowband harmonics i think are from um, the dc to dc converter and, and the digital uh, circuitry uh, but there was a strong video signal and uh, this is before and this is after so you can see that uh, all the signals were down in into the noise floor, basically. So that video signal was reduced by 15 dB, at least 15 dB. I, I can't see it through the noise anymore. Uh, so um, just just something to keep in mind, uh, especially for for wireless. So uh, finally, I, I've got a list here of um, references that I. I find useful uh, just in uh, EMC design um, in particular, but as far as um, circuit board design, I um, see, I've got some some videos. Uh, Ralph Morrison, his book Fast Circuit Boards, and um, um, Eric, uh, Dr. Eric Bogatin's book are are highly recommended on that list. So um, at this point, I, I see there are some questions. Um, let me open that and I'll try and answer as many as I can. <clears throat> so um, okay, so so here's um, uh, on s uh, slide ten. Let me uh, move this over and um, see if I can get back to uh, 
back to slide 10. Yeah, so that's that's the four layer board. Um, and let's see our questions again. Uh, explain more about the concept of signals reference to power plane. So yeah, I, I can I can do that. Um, if let me um, get my pen working again. Let's see. So if if we have good decoupling between the planes. Oops, wait a minute, wrong, wrong slide, there we go. If we have good decoupling between the planes, between the return plane and the power plane, um, then uh, it's not as critical, but uh, very often designers forget to add uh, uh, these decoupling capacitors where they're going from, um, say one side uh, top layer to bottom layer for example uh, we want that decoupling capacitor uh, adjacent to that area uh, the problem with uh, the four layer board design is that uh, was with a 62 mil spacing um, the, the spacing between the, the return plane and power planes are, is too far apart uh, for good high frequency and um, I, I like to I like to see the spacing about three mils to two to three mils apart for good uh, high frequency decoupling between the return plane and power plane um, if you uh, do a search by name plus EMC you will find um, webinars that have been recorded that go much more into uh, PC board design for low EMI, uh, as well as uh, do a search on Rick Hartley or Dan Beaker. Um, there's, uh, you know, I, that that's the basic issue. Uh, how does the return current on signals, uh, on this signal layer, uh, get a reference back to to the to this power plane that, that's the question and the, the only way this works is with plenty of decoupling capacitors okay let's go on to the next one Okay, uh, here's a good one from Rene. For ESD, if I don't have a, a metal enclosure, where exactly does the current go? Uh, great question. Um, by the way, if I don't get to these questions, um, I will uh, later on uh, answer each one and uh, get those posted. Yeah, I will send everyone a link to the forum to Sierra Connect, and uh, you can post the questions there, and can uh, can can answer. Yeah, be be happy to do that. But th this is a great question for ESD. ESD discharges are usually referenced to Earth or something near Earth. Uh, it's it's wherever the person is discharging into the product, right? So it wants to return back to Earth. Uh, so if you if you have a product here and you you zap into it with ESD, uh, that is um, ideally it's going to go to the chassis and um, through capacitive coupling back to Earth. Uh, and this this goes true uh, holds true for uh, portable devices like calculators and smartphones. Uh, if you zap into something you're holding in your hand, uh, your hand has capacitance to Earth, and that is that is the, the return path is capacitive. Um, 
this question uh, from Jerome on ground versus earth, uh, I would refer you to uh, Dr. Todd Hubing's website where he uh, explains that uh, in some detail. Um, he, he's got a whole, um, in fact, you probably will find a webinar that he's done. Um, but uh, ground, ground is really a reference uh, or zero volt reference in your system. And Earth is uh, more of a safety, um, a, a safety uh, thing uh, for uh, like the green wire ground. But I agree, there's a lot of confusion there. Um, here's a question: Would the shielding for a DC to DC converter? Let's see. Having trouble there. Would the shielding for a DC to DC converter be the same as the heat sink? Uh, or would the shield go around the heat sink? Um, so uh, another good question. Um, heat sinks are problematic, especially if it's uh, if the uh, heat sink is on a uh, like a line operated DC to DC or uh, AC to DC converter, for example, where you're switching up to 300 and some volts, uh, that heat sink can act as a as an antenna. Uh, it needs to ideally needs to be connected back to uh, your um, ground return um, in multiple pl places. Um, if you can't do that, then then a local shield over the whole thing is the answer. And um, so you need to poke a lot of holes through that local shield for heat transfer. Um, question on the absorber, uh, does temperature and humidity affect the performance of the absorber? Uh, I'm not sure. Um, there's a number of manufacturers that make this material and i guess i would refer back to them um <laughs> the question on emi bench test equipment um i will answer that offline uh, because um, there's a good article that uh, was posted uh, showing uh, several engineers test benches and the equipment used so i'll i'll answer that offline um yeah, so is fence, uh, Ahmed asks, is fence essentially an exposed copper area connected to the ground? Uh, of course, we, we want to call it return plane. Uh, yes, it is. Exactly. It's a, it's a place where we can attach the local shield uh, back to the return plane. Um, here's a good question by Zahid. Uh, when you use near field probes, do you use some kind of software for correlation with the adjacent components or do you do it manually? Um, uh, so, I, no, I, I don't use any software. The, um, the, the whole purpose, at least for troubleshooting purposes, for using near field probes is to simply identify um, high energy, high harmonic sources on your circuit board or system, and so uh, I don't fool around with how to how to compensate or correlate uh, what I'm measuring with a near field probe to anything else. Um, if if there's an adjacent component that could be interfering with my measurement, I'll use a smaller H field probe, and that that helps. Um, yeah, for, uh, Karthik asks for a product to be immune to radiated noise. Do we have another technique apart from shielding? Uh, yes. Uh, filtering, uh, is, is uh, often the answer and a much cheaper answer. Um, so, uh, for example, um, um, uh, analog circuits are highly, uh, sensitive to, uh, radiated RF fields, 
and simply placing a, a hundred picofarad capacitor across the plus and minus inputs to an op amp are enough to filter that that RF so it doesn't affect the bias point or that kind of thing. <laughs> um, if you started EMI or EMC from the beginning, what road path would you recommend? Um, I've I've started a, a series of articles on um, on the um, in compliance um, website called EMC Bench Notes. It's going to be a blog series, and I I am um, trying to answer that question in that blog series. So. Uh, go to uh, In Compliance Mag, I think, uh, for magazine, incompliancemag.com, and then search for EMC Bench Notes. Uh, I'll answer that more fully offline. Um, if there is a power plane adjacent to a high frequency signal, how does return current find? ground. Okay, I think we've answered that, but I'll, I'll answer that offline uh, in more detail. Uh, for ESD protection, is it really necessary uh, to use a bi-directional diode or uh, is a unidirectional diode sufficient? Um, I, I will answer that better offline. Um, there There's a reason to use one or the other. So, uh, so I'll, I'll uh, I'll tackle that offline. Um, see, what is the name of the website you referred to for webinars regarding PC board routing? That that would be uh, learnemc.com. That that is um, Dr. Todd Hubing's website. Excellent teacher. Uh, he he also has online courses on various subjects. So uh, you want to check out his website. Uh, what else? Okay, what technique do you use to protect against high intensity magnetic fields? Okay, that's an interesting question because, uh, you know, we, we never really had um, high magnetic fields in most products. Uh, when we got rid of uh, video uh, CRT displays, uh, which generated high uh, magnetic fields. So I, I was I was uh, having worked in HP's uh, oscilloscopes division. I was a, I was a happy camper when we got rid of when, when we transitioned from CRTs to LCDs. Although LCDs have their own problems, um, so you you need to have a high permeability shield material. And uh, a very common one is um, uh, mu metal. So if you have like a sensor that uh, high magnetic fields, so uh, you would use mu metal for that. Um, Lucy, how much longer do you want to go? Uh, we only have, I mean, I don't know, it depends. If you want to keep going, please do. Otherwise, uh, I can send everyone the link to the forum for them to ask questions. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, answer one more here. <laughs> um, looking at your suggested emissions troubleshooting kit, including sniffing probe, current probe, and unshielded emissions setup in a conference room. Um, let me get a drink here. <clears throat> uh, but we have lots of background noise, and I, I think the reference really is uh, ambient transmitters when you're doing uh, pre-compliance testing. <clears throat> And uh, yeah, that, that is an issue. Uh, you have to be um, somewhat um, knowledgeable about, <clears throat> about um, you know, what transmitters are where in the frequency spectrum. For example, AM broadcast, FM broadcast, 
uh, the digital television now, uh, where the cell phones are located, where two-way communications uh, is located. And so there's uh, there's ways of searching for that on the web. Um, but, um, and, and then um, some software, uh, for example, the uh, Tektronix EMC View software that I use for doing pre-compliance testing uh, has a, a way to uh, capture all the ambient transmitters uh, that are that are uh, interfering with, with the product and canceling them out or, or nulling them out. Uh, so, you, so all you see is the product. Uh, but if there's ever a question, you can turn the product, you can cycle the power on the product and verify that whether a harmonic is uh, from the product or from some ambient source. So there's there's ways of dealing with that, and um, I've I've talked about that a little bit in my live seminars, um, and maybe that's um, a good topic for a future article. So thank you for that. I think uh, I think at this point uh, we probably ought to wrap up and and um, honor everybody's time. I I do thank everyone for uh, joining this session and um, we are recording it and I will, uh, uh, Lucy will be giving me uh, all your questions uh, which I'll answer in much more detail. But uh, thank you very much for participating. Thank and you so much again, Lucy, well, you Thank you everyone for joining. Have a very good day and thank you, Ken. Oh, you're you're very welcome. We'll do it again sometime. Sounds great. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day. Bye bye.